Good morning, Ivy Church. Uh, it's an absolute privilege to be speaking today. If you don't know me, my name's Matt. Please come and grab me and say hi if we've never met. Um, I'd love to meet you. Um, we're in a series called Find Your People, uh, and we're looking at community. Um, we're looking at where we've gone wrong, um, why, and in a world where we're more connected than ever, um, we're actually lonelier than ever. Um, and today we're going to be starting the journey of how to get back to living in community and doing relationships the way that God has designed them. All throughout the series, uh, we've looked at Genesis. And the reason why is because the Garden of Eden, before sin entered, is the clearest picture of community working perfectly that we have. So as we start, um, I'd just like to read from Genesis 2, 18 to 25. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and yet they felt no shame. Just as we start, uh, I'm just gonna pray for us. Yeah, Lord, we just thank you so much. Um, we worship you, we love you. Um, we just pray that you would um, speak to us this morning, guide the words that are coming out of my mouth, um, guard the ears that you hear it, um, and Lord Jesus, that these would be your words um, and not my own. Um, that passage is a snapshot of what we're looking at in this series. But even in these few verses, if you slow down and really get to grips with this image, there are five realities that heaven on earth looks like. There's proximity, they enjoyed physical closeness with God and each other. There was transparency. They were naked, but felt no shame. They were fully known, yet fully loved. Accountability. They lived under submission to God and each other. There was shared mission. They were given a clear purpose and calling to care for creation. And there was consistency. They couldn't quit each other. They needed each other and shared everything together. So in the next few minutes, uh, we're just gonna have a look uh, in a bit more depth at what each of these look like in our context. Uh, but I'd like to preface by saying there's so, so much depth and richness in each of these areas um, that I'm not gonna be able to fully cover them. Um, so I'd really encourage you to dive into this uh, yourself or with friends in your grow groups um, using the Right Now Media content or Jenny Allen's book called Find Your People which is what this series is based off. So we're gonna dive into the first mark of true connection, which is proximity. You know, proximity breeds intimacy. Um, Adam and Eve were made out of love by God, and Eve was actually made out of Adam. Um, what an amazing picture of proximity and intimacy. Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. We have some amazing people that call Ivy their home uh, connected in all sorts of spheres. And you may know Steve and Sarah Small, who uh, have just led the Proximity Conference a few weeks ago, which is Eden's conference. Sarah was an elder here, and Steve is on staff. And if you don't know who Eden are, uh, they're a group of urban missionaries who move into disadvantaged communities and do life with neighbours, sharing the good news of Jesus, creating a deep sense of community. They call their conference Proximity uh, because they've really fully got this principle. They understand that being close to people physically 
has a huge impact on being close to people emotionally. And you know, um, with all our technology, with FaceTime and Zoom, uh, they're incredible and useful ways of keeping in touch with people. But if you've ever lived in close proximity with someone, you'll know uh, that you get to know their comings and their goings, their quirks, their habits, um, and also probably what winds you up about them more than anyone else. But you know, these are signs of intimacy and they're signs of closeness. It's really hard to get annoyed by someone that you don't ever interact with. But the barrier to this is busyness. Uh, myself and my housemates uh, sat down the other day and we realised that even though we lived together, we'd all been so busy that the extent of spending time together for quite a few months had been basically, hello mate, you're right, whilst we were on to our next appointment. Uh, and that's not because we didn't want to spend time together, uh, it's just because we were too busy. Um, and we realised that even though we saw each other every day, uh, we all started to miss each other and actually feel quite lonely at times. So I want to ask you something like this. Who do you see most often? And where do you see them? Finding your people is not about adding more to an already hectic schedule. It's about recognizing the people you're already spending time with and realizing that these are potential people for you to build vibrant and thriving relationships with. Once you've recognized these people and decided you want to invest in them, please, please don't be too busy that you start to grieve or lose out on relationships with people that you see uh, every single day. The second point today is transparency. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been vulnerable with someone and ended up being hurt by it? Uh, I think we've all been there. Um, and to be honest with you, if you take this talk and run with it, uh, you'll likely be there again. But that doesn't mean that it's wrong. Pain and shame are the tools that the enemy uses to stop us living in transparency. He uses lies like, they won't understand, or they won't accept me or love me if they knew the thoughts I think or the things that I've done. And you know, this is the same lie as in the Garden of Eden that our ancestors believed, and they had to hide themselves from God. They thought he wouldn't love them anymore, uh, so they went and hid uh, in their shame. But listen to this, God went and found them. God still wanted them to be transparent and in community. God still loved them no matter what. He knew what they'd done, and yes, there was consequences, but that doesn't mean there's not grace and love. So what role does pain and shame play in our lives now? If we had trusted Christ to save us, well, let's read Romans 8, 1 to 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me ask, is that you? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. There is no condemnation for you if you're living for Jesus Christ who died for you on the cross. What's amazing is the way we fight the lies of the enemy is by bringing light to what the enemy tries to condemn us with. If we bring it to the light and are forgiven and shown grace and love by one another, then how can the enemy condemn us? He has no power anymore. And the amazing thing is that this is the way God has designed uh, for us, his church, to experience his grace daily. What a gift, what a caring, gracious and humble God that he has chosen us to be the tool that gives his grace. You know, we all want to be loved. We all want to be fully loved, but we have to be fully known. Every single person here could have something, uh, if everyone knew about it, to be shameful about. There's only one perfect person in history uh, that has the right to condemn you, and this is what he says. You are blameless, you are perfect, and you are righteous in my sight. You will get hurt, and you will hurt others. We're broken people. 
But the only way to fully experience the fullness of God's grace and God's love is by using God's design. Our third mark of true connection is accountability. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so does a friend sharpen a friend. And you know, iron sharpening iron is not a comfortable process. Sparks fly. Uh, it's harsh, abrasive, and very painful if you got in the middle of it. Well, that's what we're called to be as friends sometimes. But you know, if we miss out on the hardest and harshest parts of relationship, you're also gonna miss out on the most important and the best parts of relationship, which are change and growth. So how do we do this well? Well, John 1 verse 14 says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. We are called to be full of grace and truth. Grace without truth is what our world has now. Have you ever heard anyone say anything along the lines of speak your truth, each to their own, or you do you? See, there's plenty of grace there, but there's no solid biblical truth. And the problem with you do you is that you are the reason, and that is the reason that sin first entered the world. But on the other hand, truth without grace leads us back to be saying, being saved by our works instead of by grace. If we want to be accountable and we want to be like Jesus, both in being accountable to others and for others being accountable to us, we have to find the right balance of grace and truth. With this in mind, to live in the fullness, we have to own up and we have to be corrected. Proverbs 12 verse one says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. And time and time again, in scripture we see this. Hebrews 13 verse seven, Galatians six verse one, Ephesians four verse 25, Matthew 18 verse 15, Proverbs 15 verse 22, Ephesians five verse 21. And yet we still hate words like submission, accountability and correction. Why? It's because of our pride. The enemy will use pride to tell us that either I'm so great that I don't need accountability or but my reputation is so great, I can't have people know about this. But every single one of us has done wrong and every single one of us needs accountability. You know, to have the best parts of being a supernatural community that's all about Jesus, we have to get this step right. As a church, we've been looking at uh, what it looks like to be a supernatural community that's all about Jesus. And we've based that on Acts 2, 42, verse 47. Um, they devoted themselves to the word, to worship one another, shared all of their wealth, um, and they saw signs and wonders. However, I think we might have forgotten what comes before that. Let's read directly before that in Acts 2, 37 to 41. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. You know, if we want the fruit of being a supernatural community that's all about Jesus, we have to repent. We have to be accountable. If we want to have community the way that God designed it, we have to do it his way, which looks like repentance, accountability, stepping out of our pride, comfort and fear and being honest and open with each other. Accountability is not about condemnation, it's about restoration so that we can call out the lies of the enemy and champion each other. You know, it's not about pulling people down, it's about getting underneath people to push them up so that each of us can live in the fullness of Christ. Uh, we all have blind spots. It's going to be messy. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be painful. You're going to get hurt in relationships because we're humans. We get things wrong and we hurt people, but it doesn't mean it's not God's design. Our fourth marker is shared mission. You know, throughout the Bible, uh, we see communities that have a mission and also 
uh, what's also really clear is that we can't fulfill a meaningful mission on our own. If we look at Jesus' life, even he didn't choose to fulfill mission alone. Instead, he chooses friends uh, to come to him and go for him. He said he'd be with them, uh, and mission starts and it ends with relationship. Right at the beginning of his ministry, uh, Jesus calls and chooses the 12 people he wants to do life with. And then right before his death and his resurrection, he sits them down and he has a meal with them. God had a mission uh, in the beginning. Adam and Eve had a mission. The Israelites had a mission. Jesus had a mission and we have a mission. What does God want you to do as part of fulfilling his mission? You know, everyone can do something. It's not up to you to change the world. It's up to you to influence your spheres and your peers, to see how God uses that to change the world. Holly, uh, just a few weeks ago, said, we just bring the fuel and God brings the fire. Our final mark of true connection is consistency. And uh, in this case, consistency just means sticking around. There were some researchers at the University of Kansas who decided to figure out how long it would take to become best friends with someone. It's a pretty good study. Um, but they found out that to move from an acquaintance to a casual friend takes 50 hours. To move from a casual friend to a real friend is about 90 hours. And then from a real friend to a very close or best friend, it takes around 200 hours of spending time with that person. So why is it 200 hours? What happens in this time? Let me tell you, life happens. Uh, you upset each other, you hurt each other, you both make mistakes, but you forgive each other, you love each other, you learn and you grow from each other. You know, so often we run from relationship at the first sight of conflict. I'm sure you've done it. Uh, I definitely have done it, um, but I think about the people that I'm closest to and think about the people you're closest to, you've known the longest, whether it's a family, uh, a spouse or a friend, I'd be shocked if you've never had to deal with conflict in that relationship. You see, we have to stay when it gets hard. It's the only way to get better. Throughout her book and her series on Right Now Media, Jenny Allen uses the phrase, you'll disappoint me, I'll disappoint you, God won't disappoint us. And it's the truth. We're broken people, every single one of us. And if we run when things get tough, we aren't going to see the fruit, which looks like growth, and it looks like getting closer. You'll never know the way uh, relationships, the way that God designed them, with unconditional love, if you don't. Um, and I, listen, I know there are times that you need to get out of that dangerous or toxic relationship and I'm not unaware of the fact that in some cases we need to distance ourselves from people. However, I do think that we've taken it a step too far and conflict has become a get out of jail free card, an excuse to jump ship when things get a little bit uncomfortable. You know, the world tells us that conflict breaks relationships, but I firmly believe that it's the other way around. I really truly believe that scripture time and time again shows us that conflict done well makes relationships stronger. Just look at the conflict in Jesus' life. You know, how many times does Jesus rebuke, correct, and restore his disciples? This is conflict. It's disagreement, it's uncomfortable. But you know, they stuck around. Uh, because conflict is safe when you know that you're not going to leave each other. Because then it's done in love, in restoration, and to make things better than what they are right now for everyone. So proximity, transparency, accountability, shared mission, and consistency are our five points today. You know, I wonder if anything has really struck a chord today, if you've really resonated with anything in particular. Please take some time to pray and ask God what he's revealing to you. Maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about just one person or one of these. Um, maybe he's speaking to you about someone you need to connect or reconnect with. But I want to finish with this. John 14, 35 says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. In the end, it comes down to loving one another well. 
Jesus said the greatest evidence to the world of God's love is our love for one another. So please don't be naive to the enemy's plans to destroy it. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be really hard. Unity has always been our biggest challenge. And the reason why is because the enemy knows that unity and our love for one another are what will change the world. Thank you.